Good afternoon. It's uh, Friday the 29th of May 2020, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson. Joining me in the studio today, Patrick Henningsen from 21st Century Wire. Welcome to the programme, Patrick. Of course, they have been pushing the idea for quite a number of weeks now that it's antibody tests that are going to be the future. Uh, we're 90, uh, NHS antibody tests from next week. This is for NHS staff uh, uh, alone, but then they're going to roll this out to, uh, much broader. Um, so that's Sky News reporting that. And in fact, the Nursing Times here, their headline even stronger. It becomes a game changer. Uh, antibody tests become a game changer. Well, are they a game changer? This is the question. Let's have a look at some of the science. Um, so here is a scientific paper, anti-spike, anti-nuclear uh, uh, capsid, uh, nu uh, neutralizing antibodies in SARS-CoV-2 hospitalized patients and asymptomatic carriers. Um, and the point that they're making here, they say using longitudinal plasma samples for, from 30 COVID-19 patients, we observed that virus-specific antibodies are detectable in 100% of patients two weeks after symptom, symptom onset. We also show that these patients produced variable levels of neutralizing antibodies, which reached a plateau two weeks after symptom onset and then declined in the majority of patients. Furthermore, we report that neutralizing antibodies were undetectable in 56% of asymptomatic carriers. Okay, so they produced a nice little graph. Let's have a look at it. Here we go. Uh, and it's very, very clear that as time goes on very quickly, uh, people, it becomes undetectable whether they've, got, whether they've ever had antibodies for COVID-19. Um, and uh, so, in fact, after 59 days, 54.5% are undetectable for antibodies. Uh, and 70, after 74 days, 63.6% .6 are undetectable for antibodies. So if the future uh, immunity passports are going to be based on the idea of antibodies, uh, then very quickly we're going to find ourselves in the position of perhaps, uh, if you remember that we, if, if we look at the Chinese model, Patrick, and, and this was uh, sort of expressed uh, by some of the, the UK-based uh, immunity passport companies, the companies are bidding for this kind of business. Uh, it looks like you might get a red, an amber and a green, but also a blue if, if it's undetermined what you are. Now, what are the rules going to be uh, for people that uh, their status is undetermined, right? Uh, antibody tests are not the way forward. They're certainly not going to be a game changer. This uh, and other scientific uh, studies show that. They don't work for a one-size-fits-all Chinese-style government-centric approach, Mike, uh, because there are problems with false positives on antibody tests as well as false negatives as well. But the accuracy on the whole with antibody tests is with the test itself, Mike, is problematic. Then you get to the other problems, which are what you said before about the length of time and antibodies will be present uh, in one system. But there's other ways that you can be immune from something like SARS-2, COVID-19, uh, but without showing antibodies. And well, I think you, we're, we're going to come on yeah. to that in a second. The, the key point here is we've been constantly hearing this narrative over the last lot of weeks uh, that we don't know whether immunity is long term. It might only be a short term immunity. And of course, if you're basing your statement on whether there are antibodies present in your body, then of course you can make that claim. You might be able to make that claim that, that you that no longer have antibodies are no longer immune to the second wave, which is going to come along, right? But here's the key point, Patrick. But we don't even know, before we go, Mike, we don't even know if SARS-CoV-19 is going to be around for a long time either because the original SARS was crushed and extinguished and pretty much disappeared out of the general population in season, Mike, or in a year. Uh, absolutely. So they're basing, they're reconstructing this new normal based on the unknown or this prediction that somehow COVID-19, the rock star of respiratory viruses, is going to have a long career like Mick Jagger and be touring the world for years and years. And we don't know that. In fact, uh, you look at other respiratory diseases, Mike, other coronaviruses, it might not be that, in fact. So, but yet they're rolling out all these programs. The gravy train is endless. Yep. Okay. So here's the, the next key point. Uh, immunity comes from T cells, not antibodies on a long-term basis. Here's Science uh, Magazine. Uh, T cells found in COVID-19 patients bode well for long-term immunity. Uh, and uh, they're saying that uh, the T cells help us fight some viruses. 
Uh, their importance for battling SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, has been unclear. Now, two studies reveal infected people harbor T cells that target the virus uh, and may help them recover and so on. So let's look at, uh, at one of the uh, scientific papers. Targets of T cell responses to SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus in humans with COVID-19 disease and unexposed individuals. This is really important, unexposed individuals. Let's have a look and see what they're uh, saying here. Uh, importantly, we detected SARS-CoV-2 reactive CD4 T cells in 40 to 60% of unexposed individuals, suggesting cross-reactive T cell recognition between circulating common cold coronaviruses and SARS-CoV-2. Right. So obviously there's more work needs to be done here, Patrick. But, 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 but this is this is absolutely indicating that there are some people that have never been a significant number of people that have never been in, uh, uh, infected with uh, COVID-19 with SARS-CoV-2 have immunity built in based on immunity they developed through exposure to other coronaviruses, including the common cold. That's so important. That's what's called the adaptive immune system, Mike. And by the way, for a respiratory disease that would first uh, get into your system through the nose and the throat, you also have a, a top layer immune functions in the tissue, in the mucous membranes of the sort of resp uh, beginning of your respiratory tract. And again, that's another part of the adaptive immune system. So between this and T cells, you can, in theory and in practice, according to this study, Mike, have some level of immunity to COVID-19 without ever being infected by it. That's an incredible uh, point, Mike, to make. It absolutely is. So when we've got uh, headlines like this from the BBC uh, from a day or two ago, uh, NHS app paves the way for immunity passports. And as we've already uh, indicated here, that immunity passports look might look like the Chinese model. And certainly this is how... Uh, some people in the UK envisage it happening uh, where you're given a green and amber or a red status, uh, but also a blue status based on whether they can actually identify what your status actually is. Um, then uh, on the basis that, that antibody testing seems to be the way that they're going, and we've just shown uh, evidence that antibody testing is not reliable, uh, the fact that they're ignoring, uh, it seems, T-cell status uh, in this, what this begins to look like is uh, the new normal involves immunity passports uh, and a, a moving status. So if Boris is talking about having a moving scale of one to five for what the whole country is doing, uh, immunity passports seem to be heading in the direction of a moving status for us as individuals. So the country may be relatively open, but we as individuals end up completely locked down or the country ends up locked down and some lucky individuals end up less locked down. Um, this becomes a very, as you say, chaotic and complicated situation. And uh, it can only be utterly divisive uh, amongst friends, families, communities. And that, that status that you're talking about that the government is supposedly monitoring and communicating to the public, Mike, that's a completely arbitrary status. That's, that, that's something that's uh, based on computer models that's coming from the science advisors. It doesn't necessarily reflect the reality out in the world. And in fact, it's not scientific. There's a debate that you can have about the wizardry of computer models. Isn't that how we got into this lockdown mess to begin with is an over-reliance on computer models, and that's exactly how the R number is determined. It's through a complicated set of assumptions that are programmed into computer models. It ignores the dynamics of any particular outbreak or any particular epidemic. It's purely uh, an exercise of mathematics and computers. Doesn't always reflect reality, and that's the problem. Uh, absolutely, we'll come on to R in a second, just before we get there. If you like what the UK Column is doing and if you'd like to support us, then please head over to ukcolumn.org forward slash community where there are options to help us out there. And uh, another reminder that if you would like to uh, send a, a letter to David Noakes uh, and offer support, then uh, his prison number A7081DY. He is at HMP Exeter uh, 30 New North Road, Exeter EX 44EX. Uh, now, one of the other uh, amazing slides that uh, Boris likes to present is the R number slide. Uh, here it is from COBRA, um, showing what happens if R is three, for example, that shows uh, how many people end up being infected by that. Uh, if R is one, how many people end up being infected by that. Uh, well, 
I just wanted to highlight uh, this website, Patrick, uh, the COVID-19 excel <coughs> accelerometer dashboard. Now, it's quite hard to find this because if you type in COVID-19 accelerometer dashboard into Google, uh, you won't find it. Uh, it's quite interesting that they don't seem to want to list it, but uh, it's quite a good website because they attempt to calculate uh, R for a, a, quite a number of countries around the world, as you can see. Um, and uh, well, who's behind this? Uh, it is uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Garegan uh, Papoan, uh, who is uh, from um, Maryland University in the United States. He's Armenian, uh, and he and his team have been uh, working on building a model for this. The model uh, has several caveats, um, and, and they, they do explain the caveats on their website very well. Uh, they're not claiming that it's 100% accurate, because of course it can't be 100% accurate. Uh, but one of the one of the key points that they make, Patrick, is uh, that um, it, the model really only works um, if uh, you, you, they may not have access to the total number of infections in any particular country. But they say that so long as the the, the way that the infections are counted remains the same, uh, is consistent across a period of time, then they can be relatively accurate uh, with with the R number. But what they the point that they make is that if if uh, countries and governments start uh, changing the situation, for example, by doing much more testing over time. So this week they're only testing at this level. Next week they're testing at a higher level. The following week they're testing at a higher level again. Then it becomes much harder to accurately model the thing. And so when we look at these graphs in a second, their point is that as time has gone on uh, and more tests have been done, that actually their model will probably over uh, estimate the R number. So where they're showing, for example, uh, that uh, the UK is uh, currently at 1.2. That's probably an overestimate, an overestimate because of the extra testing that's going on at the moment. But there's there's their graph, which very closely reflects, as we'll see in a second, uh, the official uh, narrative for R. Um, although the, the British government doesn't want to put any numbers on the graph that they have produced, they've just sort of produced a nice little picture. Um, but uh, this is the key point, Patrick. Uh, this was locked down here. Uh -huh, yes. Right. So uh, R was already uh, rapidly on its way to one whenever they decided to move to lockdown. So this is just another piece of evidence we've shown you over the last uh, couple of weeks, a few weeks, um, how that for other ways of counting, uh, that it looks pretty much the same. That lockdown was inappropriate. It came too late. Um, even you know, even if it was going to work at all, and therefore it wasn't the right response. Uh, that's for the UK. Let's have a look at the United States. Pretty much the same situation. I appreciate that not every that that date for for lockdown in the US is a bit of a guesstimate because different states locked down at different times. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, I think that that date that I've put on that graph was for when New York uh, locked down, who were one of the first. Um, but it's the same picture, Patrick. Sure. It's the same picture. Even so, with a margin of error, it's, it still tells a very clear story, which is that the R number, even with a margin of error, even if you take their data at face value, it, it has already peaked before lockdown. Uh, miles before lockdown. Uh, and so this is the government's uh, effort at the same kind of graph, and it looks very similar. So, so these guys have got it largely correct. And that's why we're focusing on this, right? Because the whole policy of uh, lockdown uh, part two, uh, here's uh, Al Johnson there. Uh, the whole policy here is based really on the R number. So let's, let's try to extrapolate what exactly is the R number? Can you actually use the R number? That's the big question. Everything is hinging on the R number. So let's take a closer look at what the experts say. Let's look, talk to the top pathologists and epidemiologists in the country. I know they're probably not sitting on the SAGE team, but they do exist and they are working in institutions uh, around the country. Here is Dr. John Leemike, leading pathologist in the UK. This is what he had to say about the use of the R number by the government. He says, as a former professor of pathology and someone who has had a long research career, I'm very familiar with critical assessment of data. And in the case of R, I can tell you that this is not a strong enough number to bear the burden of any government policy, let alone a policy with the magnitude of lockdown. That's Dr. John Lee, but he goes on, and I think this is quite poignant. In fact, the epidemiological models that generate R are probably less reliable than long-range weather forecasts. 
This is, again, Dr. John Lee, top UK pathologist. That's what he has to say mm -hmm. about the, uh, the R number, Mike. So, I mean, there's plenty of these experts uh, that have weighed in on this, uh, and we'll show you another one as well. But uh, the, the point is, is, is it enough to, to weigh your whole policy? And think about the enormous costs of lockdown to the economy, to society, to the government itself in terms of uh, confidence and the public trust in government. These are all prices that the state might pay and the people might pay for a lockdown policy. And it's all hinging on, for at least the last few weeks, Mike, on the R number. Mm -hmm. First it was, we the lockdown was to save the NHS. And then lockdown would be lifted once the NHS caught up and the capacity caught up to the surge in COVID cases, which never actually arrived. But the, the there's been two months now to expand the capacity of the NHS. So most countries did it fine. Mm -hmm. In fact, the countries that didn't lock down, they didn't have uh, their healthcare system overrun. It didn't happen, basically. It's only really happened anecdotally in a couple of major cities around the world that it seemed to be overrun, but then on closer inspection, it really wasn't. We're talking mainly about Northern Italy, New York City, and you could say put Spain in that category mm -hmm. as well. So, but let's, let's move on and see what some of the other experts had to say about the R number. This is uh, Dr. Sunetra Gupta. Apologies for the misspelling of her first name. That's uh, my fault. Theoretical epidemiology professor at Oxford University. This is what she has to say about the R number. In almost every context, we've seen the uh, epidemic grow, turn around, and die away, almost like clockwork. Mike here, she's talking about the behavior of the virus in every country, not just the UK. They follow a familiar pattern. Different countries have had different lockdown policies, and yet what we've observed is almost a uniform pattern of behavior, which is highly consistent with the SIR model. That's a standard epidemiological model to do with contagions and effect infections. And she continues and says, to me, this, that suggests that much of the driving force was due to the buildup of immunity. This is a really important concept. Mike. And it's hinted by the fact that the French uh, and uh, others are now suggesting that th this virus was at work November, December time, months before we it was ever even a headline in the Daily Mail. Yeah, and she, she goes on to explain why that's significant. And here, the R number, the R rate, as she says, is principally dependent on how many people are immune. It's maximum transmission potential, and the maximum transmission potential can only uh, be realized in a population that is completely susceptible. Mm. Now, and just to move on, uh, once it, the virus, starts to spread through the population, its R number declines from its maximum potential of R0, uh, and then the reason it does that is because it's using up its resources, it's using up the susceptible members of the population, mm. the people who are catching it. Those are susceptibles, and those susceptibles are becoming immune, at least temporarily says Dr. Gupta, and then finally, to round this analysis off. So I don't think you can calculate R in the absence of knowledge of how many people are immune. So she's basically saying that the R number is really irrelevant uh, in terms of determining, uh, you know, what, what is the true case of the virus uh, path uh, and trajectory within a population. Mm -hmm. And she's, she's saying that very clearly. Other experts have said the same thing, Mike. So it's really doesn't, it doesn't really work. Why? Because it's a theoretical number. It's, it's modeled. If the modeling is wrong, if the assumptions are wrong, then the results of the R number are going to be wrong that the government's presenting. This is why the top epidemiologists are shying away from relying on something as arbitrary and as uh, convoluted, in some cases, as the R number. Mm. Those are the experts saying this, not necessarily us. But then, so what does this mean in the, the big picture here? So here is the uh, famous uh, tripwire graph, uh, which was released by Al Johnson. There he is again. Uh, so this is the tighten restrictions if the R number goes above one. So again, the, uh, the disease R number should only apply to a population that is completely vulnerable uh, to, to the disease, i.e. where everyone is susceptible. That's the point. It only really works in a theoretical setting or some kind of a controlled environment, like the Diamond Princess cruise liner, for instance. Mm -hmm. In a real population, it's much more complicated than that. In fact, you might not want to be using a com computer model uh, unless you're absolutely certain that it's being programmed 
completely perfectly and we know from past experience with computer models that really doesn't happen very often so there's only two possibilities here is that if no one had the disease yet so you could model the r number accurately at the beginning of an epidemic mike if nobody had it and you could track it in real time and the second option there is uh, there's no way to control the spread of disease so both of those things don't apply to the uk uh, not only we were very late in the game in terms of infections, but uh, it, we, we absolutely have ways mm -hmm. to control disease. You have treatments, you have sanitation, you have uh, hospitalization, pharmaceutical interventions, lots of things, the trappings of the modern world, basically. And so they're trying to basically, the government's trying to say with its approach to the R number that no, we don't have any of those things and this virus can just break out and run away at any time. And we know from respiratory diseases that are seasonal that that actually doesn't happen in reality. So again, what sort of science are they being guided by? But we'll go back to this graph, and here's the other point here. And this, the, the, the Bill Gates version, Mike, would be, we don't have any vaccines uh, left. I, it's covered up here, but I call that MS Gates speak, mm -hmm. basically. So he would say, Yes, we could use the R number if nobody had been vaccinated yet. He's implying that everyone needs to get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So that's how he would look at the R number there. So basically the whole basis of this is completely, um, it doesn't work. It's null and void, basically. And so let's go back here. And uh, the final conclusion, Mike, is that computer modeling is based on elaborate assumptions. And who do we have to thank for that? There's Neil Ferguson uh, as well, the Imperial College modeler himself extraordinaire and so again mike it's just a total reliance on computer models here we are once again mm. computer modeling part two uh, absolutely so where does that take us it takes us to infections hospitalizations already peaked in march so again graph after graph after graph showing the same thing peaks in march uh, and no need for lockdown now exactly we'll take a closer look here and we'll just circle that section that's march 18th by the way this is from the cdc's own data mike uh, but also from uh, newt witkowski and his academic report that was released uh, last month so that's covid 19 hospitalizations peaked on march 18th this was before lockdown in the united states mm. So again, all of this mask wearing now in the middle, middle of May, people are putting on masks and there's fights over PPE and masks. But we're showing you right there, the virus had already peaked, infections had peaked in the United States. Let's look at the UK because it's even more interesting, actually. Infections, hospitalizations already peaked in March. And this is data here. As you can see, let's look at that's around April 10th. Uh, so in, infections would have predated that by about 14 days. So that would have put you in March, late March. But that's uh, deaths per day. That's the highest number in April 10th. Mm. Okay, we're now at the end of May. So it's, it's clearly tailed off uh, by then. And this, there's infections per day, Mike. That's also around April 10th, mm. April 12th. So again, we can see that uh, the, the virus had already done its thing. And just to give you a, a better look here, this is from the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine in Oxford, looking at uh, Professor Carl Hennigan's data. And what we can see here, it's very clear, there's the lockdown line right there. That's March 24th. But look at respiratory infections in the country, Mike. They peaked well before that. So again, uh, this is the real data, the real numbers here. And it's telling a very different story than what the government is trying to basically tell the public with the science. So they're being guided by the science, we're, we're told constantly. But yet, which science are they being guided by? Because surely the science they're being guided by isn't taking the real data into account. It's science fiction as far as I can see. So in the other myth that we just want to... Uh, uh, blow out of the water is the COVID exponential myth. A lot of people saying it's exponential. The COVID growth has been exponential. At no time has it really been exponential. And who's telling us this? It's none other than Dr. Michael Levitt. He's a professor of structural biology at Stanford University who won the Nobel Peace Prize or the Nobel Prize for Science, sorry, in 2013. He says, from the very first confirmed case, the rate of growth of COVID-19 confirmed cases is not constant. Thus, growth was never exponential. Very important point. But he does go on and say, so the terrible thing that we're fearing is not true about a single outbreak. Instead, the constant exponential rate is decreasing rapidly. 
although the initial growth rate is very fast, it's decreasing at an exponential rate. So the decrease is exponential, but the increase in growth of the virus was never exponential. That's from a Nobel laureate, Mike. So uh, maybe they have better people on the SAGE team that have different data and different analysis. Who knows? But we should give them a chance. Uh, they've got a couple weeks left, hopefully, of lockdown. And maybe there's some interesting science that's going to be brought forward. I, I wait with bated breath. Uh, what's Matt Hancock been up to then? Well, he's the uh, health secretary, as everybody knows. And we're, we've been constantly, of course, again, guided by the science. And uh, there's Matt Hancock there. So the question is, Mike, which science are they being guided by? And, you know, we've had our crack team. Uh, the UK column has a science advisory panel. It's, uh, it's a secret panel. But nonetheless, very highly qualified and skilled. And they've been working on this all week, Mike, to try to figure out how the government has got the science wrong. That's our UK column crack science team, okay, our advisory, our sage, as it were. And so this is what they had to share with us. And again, we'll, we'll look at this. They've come up with a, what I think is a very plausible theory here. And so we're going to bring in our uh, top scientific advisor. Some of you might know him, seem as familiar. That's uh, Officer Chief Science Officer Rimmer, and he's been advising us on what is basically the Dunning-Kruger effect. And so his theory is that the government are suffering uh, from the Dunning-Kruger effect. And basically to explain that, that's the, it's a theory that you, if you're overconfident uh, and you, you basically lack the uh, cognitive, uh, you have cognitive bias, okay? So it's with people with low ability uh, at a task, and they overestimate their ability. And it's related to the cognitive bias of illusory superiority and comes from an inability to recognize their lack of ability, Mike. So again, uh, this is where the government is, according to Officer Rimmer. They're about right there. So that's just after the peak of I'm so great and really tailing down into I know nothing. But, you know, there's another algorithm that they applied to this because we want to show a good variation and uh, dexterity of our science team. And so we're looking at the other algorithm. Here's the other way of looking at it. And again, that's where the government is there. That's just coming down off the peak of Mount Stupid uh, of the Dunning-Kruger effect. So confidence was high, not so high right now. But we want to make sure we're hoping that the government can get up here into a, a plateau of sustainability, up the slope of enlightenment. And again, that's from our team. So the Dunning-Kruger effect seems to be afflicting the government right now and the science, because the science just doesn't add up. And of course, one of the reasons is it just becomes so complicated. All these R numbers, all of these sombreros to be flattened, curves to be crushed, and, and things like that. So for the visual learners out there, we, we came up, our science team came up and found this, uh, thanks to a, a viewer of the UK column, sent this through to us. So for the visual learners out there, we, we thought this might be helpful. So as you can see, the black is the conga line of 100 people uh, during the COVID epidemic. And of course, uh, the asymptomatics are the black uh, on the top uh, line there, and below are the mild cases, uh, serious cases in blue. And the elbow you can just about see is uh, fatal. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, a bit of tongue in cheek here, Mike from the science team, but it sort of tells the picture here of has the threat been over-exaggerated? And that's really the point, not to take anything away or not being disrespectful to anybody that has lost uh, or, had an, one. Or, or people who have fallen ill because of this. What we're saying is the point is getting so ridiculous, the, the, the analysis and the media reporting right now. And so we are injecting a little bit of light humor in there just to rattle the conversation a little bit and say, how far off are we on this? Uh, absolutely. But if there's one takeaway from this program, Patrick, I think it is that if the government attempts to move towards an immunity passport and they attempt to use uh, uh, antibody tests as a basis for that, there's some pretty big questions to be answered there. And uh, that should be raising alarm bells. I think we'll we'll leave it at that point. Yeah, I think so. Look, do your own. I know this sounds like a cliche, Mike, yeah, uh, but do your own research. Yes, because you can't really trust everything that's coming from government. And so, if you have to become a quick study on epidemiology and science, science of epidemics, 
then there's plenty of good material that's uh, available on, absolutely. on uh, UK Column, 21st Century Wire, The Off Guardian, and, and a number of great websites and independent media outlets. And also Unheard uh, as well uh, is a YouTube channel that has all these great interviews from all these great ap academics that are not really getting a voice on the BBC on mainstream platforms. Absolutely. So. Okay, we will leave it there for today. Um, have a great weekend. Thanks for joining us, Patrick. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back at the same time. Uh, on Monday as usual. Uh, see you then. Bye-bye.